So for those listening, I want to invite you to think of your day and think of the ways that you do participate in neoliberal capitalism, such as buying something on Amazon, for example, or going into a corporate grocery store chain, or you know, getting into a vehicle that you bought in a cor- corporate car place, right? That would all be participating in global corporate capitalism. However, if you offer eggs to your neighbor when they come over and knock on the door, or you give a ride to a friend, right? That's the sharing economy or the gift economy, right? You go into your public library, right? That's the sharing economy as well. A tool library in your neighborhood or a worker cooperative grocery store, right? That would be the solidarity economy or the new economy, right? If any of your energy comes from a renewable energy cooperative, right? So there's all these different economies that we participate in and co-create every day. Della Duncan is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Della is a renegade economist who supports individuals as a right livelihood coach, helps transition businesses as a post-capitalist consultant, and hosts the upstream podcast, Challenging Mainstream Economic Thinking, through documentaries and conversations, including the green transition, the problem with green capitalism, and the myth of freedom under capitalism. Della is also the creator and co-teacher of the Cultivating Regenerative Livelihoods Program and co-teacher of the Economics Dimension course at Gaia Education, then founded the Gaia Education with his wife, sadly passed away years ago, Uh, a work that reconnects facilitator, the course development manager of uh, Professor Dr. Fritzhof Capra's Capra courses on the systems view of life. I'm also an alumni of the Capra courses and Nodella from there and many other circles and a founding member of the California Donut Economics Coalition, a senior fellow of the Social and Economic Equity at the London School of Economics, a gross national happiness master trainer, and a senior lecturer at the California Institute of Integral Studies. I know, Della, I could probably go on a lot longer because you've done a lot of amazing things. And actually, I'm so excited we could finally have this time to meet. Welcome to the podcast and thanks for coming and being here. Thank you so much for having me. You are uh, have an amazing life and you've got much more uh, ahead of you. You've been in a lot of great circles, Fritz Hof Capra, Schumacher College, Gaia Education, um, Bhutan at the, the Center for Gross National Happiness. And, and, um, and you call yourself a renegade a- a- economist. And I, I know um, – I've heard you explain it many times before. Let's explain it first as we start off here for our listeners, if you don't mind. Yeah, so the frame renegade economist is something that I heard Kate Rayworth described as. So Kate Rayworth, founder of Donut Economics, she was called a renegade economist. And so I really appreciated that frame and said, I aspire to be a renegade economist too. But what it means to me more generally is that When we go upstream from the challenges of our time, political, economic, social, ecological, I think there's some very real challenges relating to our economic system, particularly relating to assumptions underlying mainstream economic thinking, as well as the practices, operating values of our current dominant economic systems. So to be a renegade economist is to challenge those assumptions, to critique them, and to seek and uplift systemic alternatives. 
You also have right to livelihood, coach or mentor, facilitator. Uh, ex explain that to us. Yeah, I got into Buddhism from a path of actual mic mindfulness. I was experiencing some anxiety and difficulty and I went to a therapist and they said, have you tried mindfulness? So at first mindfulness was a very self-focused kind of, uh, you know, calming nerves and anxiety way of re relating to it. But once I started to go to mindfulness retreats, uh, I went to one with Joanna Macy, the root teacher of the work that reconnects. And I was kicked off the cushion into a path of engaged spirituality or spiritual activism. And that includes the whole Eightfold Noble Path, not just one right, right mindfulness. And one of the other elements of the right the eightfold noble path of buddhism is right livelihood so in my understanding it's really taking our spirituality or our values off the cushion and into our livelihood into our lives into what we what we do what we offer how we contribute to the world so i deeply love this frame resonate with it of cultivating a path of right livelihood and i've been on that journey for myself helping to align my work with values uh, but also helping to empower others to feel more aligned in their work and values and also to be able to contribute to the challenges of our time. I absolutely love what you do. I love where you've been, uh, the groups and circles, not only when I read your biography and there's, there's honestly for the listeners, there's much more we could talk about. You've kind of followed a, a path, path of bliss where you, it seems to me as an outsider looking in that you've picked the things that have value and meaning to you, your passion that you love, and then you've gone there. You've studied with the masters, read the greats, and participated in those, and actually been surrounded by some pretty fabulous people, not only in the economic space, but in the ecological movements, in the space of systems, in Buddhism, in compassion and uh, gross national happiness and, and different thought models that are actually kind of kind of saying, how can we have a better future, a, a better world? It's funny because you mentioned Joanna Macy and I have, you know, a book of hers right here coming back to life from uh, uh, Joanna Macy right here uh, next to my desk. And, and I think to be surrounded by thought leaders and, and these great authors and future thinkers, Satish Kumar from Schumacher College, and that is just amazing. Do you also feel fortunate or was that pretty much a guided or structured method? You say, no, this is how I want to live my life. I'm going to go and seek out these pathways. And what does that journey kind of look like that you've gone on? And, and it seems pretty intentional that you've, you've kind of structured this in, in, in a specific way. I absolutely feel very fortunate and, and very grateful for having to be able to work with these, these amazing teachers. And I think it does feel a little bit of uh, like callings and, and following callings and invitations, but it also feels a little bit magical too. For example, it was that second mindfulness retreat that I just signed up for not knowing who the teacher was. And it just so happened it was Joanna Macy was the teacher. So what if I hadn't signed up for that course or what if it had been a different teacher, right? And so that then inspired this journey, which then also led to Schumacher College. That was another very fortunate moment where I was on a walk with a Buddhist nun at Naropa in Colorado, which is a Buddhist university. And we we're on this actually a theory you dialogue walk where one person shares and the other person listens. And I was sharing kind of about thinking about Buddhism and about the economic challenges of our time. And I turned to the nun and I said, hey, you know, what about Buddhist economics? What if that was a thing? Thinking that, you know, not that I was the one to originate this idea, but having, having never kind of put those ideas together in my mind. And fortunately, she turned to me and said, have you heard of E.F. Schumacher? And so it was then a search of who is this E.F. Schumacher that led me to Schumacher College, right? So it, it's, it's really uh, a path of being open to invitations and kind of callings and then being able to follow them to where they lead. Uh, but you're right, absolutely, absolutely this desire to align work with values and also can have a life of service or contribution. 
And that comes from many different people in my life. But I would really say like primarily my mom, who was just so much someone dedicated to being of service to people throughout her whole career in life. So I think that that value was really uh, developed in me as a child. And I, I just had uh, Daniel Christian Wall on the show and, and he's had a similar thing. He also uh, uh, got a degree at Schumacher College and has done many things with Gaia Education. You've worked with him before and, and different things. Um, it's also very similar. So, and, and, I, and, and you mentioned this before we started the podcast. He said, you know, you're also connected to pretty, pretty great things. I think once you find this wire, this purpose for life, and you start to look in these areas of deeper knowledge, it seems like the groups are people who are the thought leaders, who are the ones that we um, get great wisdoms from, that there are also ones that are really open and accepting. And then it just kind of gravitates towards that. Do you have some kind of idea or thought process that you went into and say, well, there's kind of an underlying uh, collectiveness or a, a consciousness that those people kind of gather and clump together and, and see each other? Or have you ever thought about how that occurs or why that occurs? Well, I would say really this experience of this retreat with Joanna Macy was the first time I was introduced to spiritual ecology, right? This concept of the ecological self or just this, these alternative worldviews that one could absolutely find in, in wisdom traditions or in indigenous teachings. But that was where I kind of experienced it. I remember doing a practice with Joanna that she led called the mirror walk, where you walk around guided by someone with your eyes closed, really using all of your senses to experience where you're, where you are. And then every once in a while, your partner says to you, open your eyes and look in the mirror. And it, it evokes this sense of a ecological self, you know, this, this guy in consciousness. And so it were, it was things like that moments like that, that just evoke this other perception of paradigms or worldviews that are more helpful for the crisis that we're in, the ecological crisis, the spiritual crisis. And then from that, yeah, there's such a whole world of teachers and spiritual leaders and writers and poets that are just in a line with this worldview that is more helpful for a thriving people and planet. Schumacher College, I've got small is beautiful here as well. Speaking of Schumacher College, um, that's one of your favorite books, I think, isn't it? Or you I, actually, I've seen you promote it a couple of times. Why is that? Why Why do you uh, uh, talk about it? Well, what's so important about Schumacher College, Small is Beautiful, and this different way of thinking of economics? Yeah, well, I think that that moment with the Buddhist nun where I said, you know, what about a Buddhist economics? And she turned to me and said, have you heard of E.F. Schumacher? She was referring to E.F. Schumacher's experience of being trained as a mainstream economist, a mainstream development economist, and then having a paradigm shift of, you know, a crisis of, <laughs> of understanding in going to Burma, right? And seeing, uh, my understanding of it is he, he, he was sent there to kind of help with development, this very Western mainstream view of development and progress. And yet he had a spiritual awakening or a spiritual deepening where he said, you know, maybe our views of progress and development in the mainstream sense are not actually helpful. And maybe there is a more holistic view. And one of the things he noticed was that people were trying to be happy with less and less instead of more and more. And so my understanding is that's kind of really what inspired Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered. And in that book, he has just so many delightful reframes like appropriate technology, for example, that are just really helpful for uh, rethinking economics, demystifying mainstream economics and, and offering alternative views. And I think I resonate personally with that story as having been someone who studied mainstream economics in undergraduate. And it was the, it was one class in economic anthropology where I learned, huh, maybe the tragedy of the commons is actually an assumption underlying mainstream economic thinking. And maybe it's not actually fact that we as humans cannot collectively manage a resource together. And it was actually there that I first saw the film 
Ancient Futures by Helena Norberg Hodge about Ladakh, another powerful, you know, paradigm shifting experience, again, around development, what what progress and development is. Um, and then another person, Manfred Max Neef, the Chilean economist, similar mainstream economics goes to a community and really finds that his tools that he's been taught are not actually helpful of human health and happiness and planetary health and happiness and kind of him and others create barefoot economics, you know, a more humble and, you know, feet on the earth sense of, of economics. So I think I'm uh, inspired by E.F. Schumacher's kind of uh, ability to kind of question everything and then unlearn it takes a lot of humility to unlearn what we thought we knew about economics and to rethink and to to criticize to challenge and then to seek out the alternative solutions and stories that'll guide us towards more planetary and human flourishing it's so inspiring to, i mean i'm almost in in a trance just listening to you speak about economics and it's so exciting and i sense your your passion but, but honestly, Della, when I ask people what economic models they're living in their daily life, one, most people couldn't even tell me whether it's neoclassical and micro, macro, if it's capitalism, if it's extractive economics, they don't know what model that they're living in. And it's okay, I guess, if they don't know what model they're living, but what it means is that they're supporting by, by not knowing doesn't mean that you're not supporting a bad model or a bad system by being in that. More importantly is I like to talk about, instead of complaining about those bad economic models that we see out there, let alone the, the way uh, economics is taught or, or around the world is, is not like what you're describing to me here at all. It's very uh, white older men uh, wearing suit and ties and a different type of, of economics that's taught around the world. Um, but there are so many alternatives just in what you've told and describing so far. You Buddhist economics, feminist economics, and, and shared economics, you know, and on and on. You've mentioned several uh, fabulous ones already. So my question is, how do we kind of tell people that there's actually so many other alternatives, local economics, local futures? You spoke about Helena Norberg. Can you kind of touch upon some of those things and where it's going and, and why it's so exciting to have these in our world and what it means for us to kind of set a different, mo different models for a better future? Yes. So one of the ways that I like to think about economies comes from two feminist economists who wrote under the same pen name, Gibson Graham. They wrote under J.K. Gibson. They just wrote Gibson Graham as their um, pen name. And what they did was they said, actually, we perform economies and we perform diverse economies. And when we speak about capitalism as this all prevalent, pervasive economy, we actually give it more power than we need to. And they invite us to see all the alternative economies that we also participate in, in and co-create every day. So for those listening, I want to invite you to think of your day and think of the ways that you do participate in neoliberal capitalism, such as buying something on Amazon, for example, or going into a corporate grocery store chain or, you know, getting into a vehicle that you bought in a cor corporate car place, right? That would all be participating in global corporate capitalism. However, if you offer eggs to your neighbor when they come over and knock on the door, or you give a ride to a friend, right? That's the sharing economy or the gift economy, right? You go into your public library, right? That's the sharing economy as well. Uh, a tool library in your neighborhood or a worker cooperative grocery store, right? That would be the solidarity economy or the new economy, right? If any of your energy comes from a renewable energy cooperative, right? So there's all these different economies that we participate in and co-create 
um, every day. The caring economy, if you care for an elder or a child in your life. So that was helpful for me to notice there's actually many different economies and to see that when we speak about capitalism as all pervasive, we give it more power than we need to. And then the invitation is how do we uplift the view, the understanding of these alternative economies and also make them more accessible for, for all of us to participate in them, to rise them out of the global sea of capitalism and connect them. And I, I, I think that one thing that's helpful in determining those is what is capitalism? What are the operating principles? And then what is not capitalism? What are these alternative structures? And to just make them more visible and to be aware of how we're participating in them. So that the economy is not something abstract or outside of us, but it's actually something that we participate in and co-create every day. Do you think it's uh, important to understand that w w no matter what economic model we're participating in, to understand how that functions and what, what by supporting that, by where we shop, where we live, by what we buy, by how we live our lives, uh, that we're actually either supporting good economic models or keeping the old bad ones, neoliberalism, neocapitalism alive. Um, and what are your thoughts or practices there? I know you have some um, uplifting messages. You have some ways of practicing and using some other tips. What, what would you suggest for us to kind of get into a, a, an awareness uh, of, of what models we're living and maybe if you could tell us why that would be important, what, what shifts or changes do we see when we have more participatory knowledge of how we live and what we do in our world? Yeah. Yeah. I think of it on twofold. I, I think there is the, the personal behavioral, right? The ways that I can personally participate in feminist economics, Buddhist economics, solidarity economy, new economy, et cetera. And those are really important. And that's everything from moving your money to, you know, like we have a regenerative social finance investment uh, in, um, organization here in San Francisco. So moving one's money, where you shop, you're right, like a worker cooperative, for example, how you move around, like all of it, right, could be your personal behavioral changes to participate in alternative economies. And they are important. And then also on that other level is the systemic. How do we shift the systems, again, to make them more accessible, but also to make more, more of the economy, these alternative diverse economies. So that would be like, you know, the public banking movement and really supporting worker cooperatives or the not-for-profit business model, uplifting that, um, supporting, you know, public health care and public education and, you know, our social safety nets, things like that. So I think it's, it is twofold, but I do love your question. It's like, how do we, how do we participate in them? And one thing that's helpful is systems thinking, right? If we don't think systemically and we don't sense into the systems, then we're unaware of the potential harm that is being caused. So one example of systemic thinking that I love, there's a woman named Sarah Corbett. She's in the UK and she calls herself a craftivist. She says, if we want our activism, no, she says, if we want our world to be beautiful, just, and kind, we need our activism to be beautiful, just, and kind. And she offers this practice of shop dropping. So she has these little scrolls of paper with a ribbon on them. And she goes to stores that have, uh, you know, either materials that are harmful to the planet or sweatshop labor. And she drops the squirrels into the pockets of that clothing. That's why it's called shop dropping. And then what happens is somebody goes into the dressing room, tries on the jacket, sees the scroll, unravels it. And it says something like, if your, if your clothes could talk, what tales might they tell? Would they tell tales of love and care or of harm and exploitation? right? And then a little bit of where to learn more. But the point is she's inviting systemic thinking into that moment. You know, how often do we think about the supply chains and the qualities of care either for the planet or for people? And so to just think more systemically, it can be very difficult because it's not always very clear or transparent, you know, what, what the consequences of our actions are. It could also be very cost prohibitive, right, to make only ethical, sustainable choices. But at least that inviting systemic thinking can help us be more aware of the implications of our economic choices and actions. 
I absolutely love that. There, uh, you know that I'm a sustainable development goal advocate, and I've said many times that the sustainable development goals are a new economic model. They're an ecological economic model. Most people are like, what? That's, that's weird. That's a Klaus Schwab conspiracy theory or, or you know, uh, woke SDGs or, or whatever they say. They're kind of just like, no, that doesn't make sense. Um, but what is regular development, development of cities, of countries, of communities, of businesses, residential, commercial development? That's an economic model of in itself. It's a, the built environment. Um, it's just regular business as usual development and the high carbon scenario, how we've always built up industry and businesses and cities and, and countries, um, which is taking a toll on our finite resources on on heat pockets in different areas. And, and that's its own economic model. So where I'm getting to is um, by December 2030, that regular business as usual development economy will spend 89 trillion US dollars. And this was before the pandemic and the Brexit and the supply chain issues and all the other craziness we've seen go on around the world. We knew for a fact that by December 2030, they would spend about 89 trillion US dollars. Now that's gone up because of all these things. Whereas we also know that sustainable development, doing it in a low carbon scenario in a much different way uh, with better materials, better sustainable practices. It's not perfect, but in, but in a different way that that would be about not, today's number is about 96 trillion US dollars. And anything uh, you know more about economics than than I do, uh, I hope. Um, but anything over about $1.5 trillion is its own economic model. And, and especially, you know, in, in the Netherlands, they have the tulip economy. So it's all based on tulip and, and growth. And, and so to just give that understanding around economics, that there's many different types of economic systems and, and, and industries and sectors, um, that, that that's interesting. But it leads right into what you were saying and that's why I bring it up. The SDGs and the SDG uh, economic model has basically paved the way for the ESG, environmental social governance. And it is a beautiful way that now through CSRD, human rights, due diligence directive, the uh, digital product passport and these things that are coming out through the European Union, we're taking into account human rights violations, scope one, two, and three emissions. Now with a digital product passport of all products being sold in the, in the European Union, all products going out of the European Union, um, they all have that traceability. What's the upstream, the downstream? Where are they made? Are they made with a fair wage? Are there human rights violations? And when you, you talk about her dropping this little note into the pockets, um, that's fabulous. And it's a local way of, of kind of having this activism and doing that. But now we see one of the, uh, the, the biggest organizations, the European Union, the commission, the, the parliamentary process in the European Union is actually one of the biggest organizations kind of moving us forward on the, on the, on the right side of how do we get into a new economic models and processes? And I, I kind of wanted to, you know, say we saw the Beyond Growth Conference that happened in, in the EU. A matter of fact, you were here teaching a course in the European Union uh, that you can tell about. But what do you see with that kind of leading up and where we're going in the future for better traceability, fairer wages, better economic models, and kind of some of these things that are really holding us accountable and moving us forward in the right direction. Can you tell us a little bit more what you see and what your thought processes are there? Yeah, I mean, I'm really tracing what you're saying through the lens of Danella Meadows, right? Systems theorist and her fabulous essay, Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in a System, which she calls like acupuncture points to change a system. And very, she has 12 of them, but very high at the top is changing the goal of the system. And the sustainable development goals and 
donut economics, gross national happiness, uh, beyond growth, all of these are ways to change the goal, the goal of development or progress to something more holistic, more like thriving people on the planet or the well-being or happiness or the economy for the common good movement, right? And so from that new goal, we have to say, what do we measure, right? As my mentor, Dr. Havin To from Gross National Happiness Center in Bhutan would tell me, he said, we are attentive to what we measure. We are attentive to what we measure. So by having these more holistic measurement tools, we are guiding our attention and our efforts towards something different. So that's really how I'm hearing the what the, the benefits and the things that you're talking about. Um, and I would say the Beyond Growth Conference and also uh, what I was doing uh, during that time, I was working with Dr. Jennifer Hinton, who worked for the Post Growth Institute and now is completing a book on the not-for-profit economy. And she really says, hey, part of the challenge of growth and part of going beyond growth is addressing the profit motive and the profit mechanism. And she has these beautiful systems diagrams that show that it is the profit mechanism in our economy that is leading to rising inequality, corporate consolidation, and political capture and ecological devastation, right? Through the profit mechanism. It's like it's like there's wealth that's leaving the economy and being kind of siphoned um, to ever, grading, ever greater inequality um, for the 1%. And then she shows an entire not-for-profit economy where all profit is redirected to social and environmental good is like a true circular economy, right? Where the wealth is redirected directed and, and recirculated and goes to addressing the challenges of our time. And she shows in that model that there is no corporate consolidation. Uh, there's not the same mechanism for rising inequality, ecological devastation, or political capture. So I was working with her at that time. So we were so happy to see and hear that the Beyond Growth Conference was happening and watch it from afar, um, but just be in kind of solidarity and in, in the same movement as folks who are challenging the growth imperative and the idea of growth as as an end goal instead of a means to an end and people who are really offering alternative goals of the economy and measurement tools that are more holistic and regenerative. I want to dive a little bit deeper because not only have you mentioned tons of different economic models and um, how they're kind of islands and they're collaborating, they're all going in the same direction. They're all kind of supporting and helping each other. There's one that was released also at this Beyond Growth, and I, I don't know if you've heard about it, it's the Earth for All. It's really interesting. They're taking five different, basically, economic models and putting them together. They're taking the, the, the limits to growth, uh, World Model 3, original systems dynamic modeling, upgrading that. Uh, uh, your granders is kind of updating the MIT computer model, the World 3 model to give us more systems dynamic thinking and process to run out scenarios. Then we've got Kate Rowers, a uh, donut economics. We've got doc, Professor Dr. Johan Rockstrom's planetary boundaries, well-being economy and post-growth or degrowth, uh, Tim Jackson, or um, I don't know if there's someone else, maybe J Jason Hickel uh, is in, in that as well. And they're putting them all together in one model. And so, if, if you were to ask somebody to say, how many ecological economic models are there, or alternative economic models that are like, what are you talking about? You know, they wouldn't even know, but you've just mentioned a dozen or more, and there's really probably over 40, 50 different models emerging. Um, how do we look at that? How do we understand that? Do we... Is it, is it kind of a battle between the best? You know, is it circular economy, donut economics? Is it shared economy? Or can we use them all? How do we view that? And, and how can you help us make sense of, of that? Now do we have another smorgasbord of options that's confusing us? Or, or, or is there a way that we kind of break it down and understand it and put it into practice and make it work for us? Yes. I think we can synthesize these models, and here's how I might do that, one way to do that. Um, the first is accepting the 
premise, the idea that was first written about, or not first written about, but was really written about about 50 years ago in the Limits to Growth paper, co-authored by many folks, including Danella Meadows, but just this idea that our economy uh, cannot grow forever. Our planet is already showing the breaking points, the tipping points, as Johan Rockstrom and the Stockholm Resilience Center would say, right? The planetary boundaries are already being breached. So we have already like recognized the limits to growth and we are suffering the consequences and we will be for, for many years. So first accepting that and also recognizing that it is a operating principle of our current dominant economic system that growth is good. Growth is seen as the progress or the, the metric of success, right? Growth of GDP, uh, growth of a business, right? And as Jason Hickel says, it's not just a uh, that a business is profitable, it's the there's an exponential rate of return of profit. So growth baked into a business success as well. So all of that, so recognizing that is step one. And all of these models would really have us be aware of the limits to growth. Um, and then after that, I think is changing the goal. So saying, let us not have growth be the goal of our economic systems. Let us have it be something more holistic. So donut economics says, let us have the goal be the meeting of human needs while staying within the planetary boundaries. Is let's say the goal is well-being for people on the planet. Economy for the common good says, let it be the common good is the goal of the economy. Gross national happiness says, let it be a holistic sense of happiness measured by these nine domains that include the ecological, the social, the psychological, the time use, the cultural, et cetera, right? And, and there's many others too. Buen vivir in Latin and South America, for example, the Wales Wellbeing Act. There's one in New Zealand, right? So there's so many. So that would be changing the goal. Okay, so we've changed the goal. We have new metrics. We have new indicators. We have a new goal of the economy. How do we then get to those goals? Now, this is where some of the other policies and ideas that you discussed come in. So circular economy, so having, you know, there not be any waste, waste being redirected and utilized in the production process. I think about Ikea. What if Ikea, this is something they're actually working on, but what if Ikea, everything that was sold at Ikea was returned to Ikea to be repurposed? for example, right? So that's circular economy. Um, it's it's a little bit more complex than that, but that's one element of it. This not-for-profit business model where you have no for-profit businesses, where all profit is redirected either to the business or directed to mission-driven work, social or ecological benefit work, right? So there's that element. Um, there's how money is created. Degrowth. Degrowth would absolutely be one way to get us within the donut, so to speak, or get us to this new goal of well-being economy, because it's recognizing that in some places we are way beyond our ecological systems, our planetary boundaries. And so degrowth would be necessary. And if we think about it consciously and we do it collectively, it doesn't actually have to cause harm as a depression or a recession would. Right. And so degrowth talks about things like the four day work week. Right. Talk about a win and us degrowing the economy, for example. But also degrowth includes things like the right to repair, right? So that if I had a refrigerator, instead of throwing it away, that it could be repaired more easily. Or an iPhone being able to be repaired more easily. That's why we have the Fairphone, right? That's modular, that can be repaired more easily. So right to repair, abolishing planned obsolescence, you know, addressing food waste or other types of waste. So all of these things, degrowth could be part of how do we get within the donut, right? How do we have that regenerative and distributive economy? Or how do we get to a more well-being economy for, the, for all? So I would say absolutely all of these ecological economics, post-growth post economics, principles and ideas can work together in a whole holistic movement to transition us to a more sustainable and regenerative economy. Out of all, all these models that we've discussed or ones that you know about, are there any where you say, boy, it's donut economics, it's really going well in Amsterdam, it's really going well here. Is there one where you'd say it's really fabulous or is it, and this is kind of where we're going to go in a minute when we speak about regeneration, 
but it, it is, is there one that you're really saying, boy, this is just working very well, or are they all place people, culture specific, what works best city specific on, on how they work and how do you see those, um, really playing out in the future. You mentioned Helena Norberg Hodge and it's uh, local futures, local economies. Uh, it's really place-based, very local, very cultural and, and bringing that in. So I wanted to ask you that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I personally see myself as a deep generalist a deep generalist. And that, that frame is from Miriam McGillish. She once told me that she said, the world doesn't need more specialists. It needs more deep generalists. And I think you are one too, Mark. I, I can imagine. I I, we know, we know a little bit about a lot of different things and we're able to connect them. Right. But we may not be a specialist in one. So I would say that, uh, you know, due to having a podcast like you and being able to be a teacher and someone who is also a researcher, I, I enjoy getting to know about a lot of them. So I wouldn't say, one is the answer. And I, and I don't think that's how systems change happen either. There's so many operating principles of our current dominant economic system that need to be shifted that I appreciate the plethora of ideas and tools and strategies to address all those different things. So I, I would say it's a very pluralistic movement. Um, however, in the realm of the changing the goal, I would say that I have seen a little bit of the place-based uh, Thing happening where gross national happiness is so of the place of Bhutan, right? It really has a cultural element to it and also the Buddhist philosophy and practice of it. And then you have like the Bristol Happiness Project and again, Buen Vivir, the economy for the common good with Christian Felber and Austria, you know, like, so I, I do feel the place based and the cultural specific elements of these movements. And I can appreciate the diversity and the unity of them. At the same time, I would say that I personally have gotten pretty involved with uh, donut economics because donut economics seems to be something that a lot of folks can resonate with. So Kate Rayworth and her team have both utilized the sustainable development goals for the inner circle of the donut, but also, as you mentioned, um, Johan Rockström and the Stockholm Resilience Center, the planetary boundaries. So utilizing those pretty global standards or global, uh, like appreciated in a global sense, ways of measuring. I think that's been really helpful for the movement. Um, and also that it doesn't have the kind of spiritual aspect of let's say gross national happiness, right? Part of gross national happiness, one of the questions on the survey is, do you believe that trees are the home of spirits and deities, right? I don't think you could ask that everywhere, right? <laughs> it would have a different different understanding. So I think that donut economics is is really well positioned to be something. It's also visual, right? Kate speaks to the visual nature of the donut being one of its benefits, like that you can see the donut in your mind or on a piece of paper and kind of get, ah, the goal is to get within the donut, the safe and just space for humanity, right? So I have found that that feels like a very helpful model to get on board with globally. And also that it connects really well with things like the well-being economy, circular economy, post-growth, like that it really is a natural ally and advocate for those models. Local Futures, Helen and Urberg Hodge, again, that film, Ancient Futures, phenomenal, Economics of Happiness, phenomenal, and I've gotten to uh, teach alongside and work with Helena over the years and just really appreciate what, what she does is really, for me, she really... Um, demystifies the global part of it, right? The, the interconnected globally and the impact of development and capitalism on the global South. And so localizing our economies to me is about bioregionalism and becoming people of place, you know, placemaking. So it's like, it is one of the answers, but it's like a different part of the answer in a way. I think also local economies ought to be more local and independent businesses that are perhaps worker cooperative or not-for-profit businesses, right? Um, but also in more uh, reciprocity and connection with place. So how are we going to measure the donut? How are we going to know about the flourishing of the planet in our place-based uh, places if we're not in deep relationship with it? So I do think lo local futures and local localizing our economies is another addition to this beautiful movement. How does regenerative or regeneration um, 
economics fit into this whole scheme of where we're going. And just in general, we, we talk a lot about re regenerative or regeneration as kind of a new and trendy thing. And uh, you've probably heard me on other, uh, other podcasts or other circles, you know, it's really not, you've heard it from Fritz Hof Capra as well, that it's actually very old. It's the way the world's works. It's always been that way. It's a, our regenerative ancestry really. Um, and those type of things. But now we're hearing, you know, regenerative economics, regenerative agriculture, regenerative well-being, um, all, all sorts of things around that. Um, how do you look at that? And, and what, what would you say going forward on, on what we see there and how we can create those conditions conducive to life, regenerating itself to flourish and to do those things that you're talking about? What, what are your thoughts or ideas on regeneration? Hmm. Yeah. So I think to speak about regeneration, we also need to think about sustainable, right? And sustainability. And I know that some folks, and I, I too in the past have thought, oh, sustainable, we don't want that because what are we sustaining, right? And it almost feels like it's sustaining of our current dominant system. However, Fritjof Capra the other day, he said in a group that I was in, he said, you know, when we talk about sustainability, it's not about sustaining the current system. It's about sustaining life. And I was like, oh, it makes total sense. So maybe we don't need to throw away sustaining or sustainability out completely. But what I do appreciate about regenerative is that it is like life affirming, life giving, right? And helping, like I think about helping nature thrive and flourish and continue to um, be a part of nature, right? Humans as a part of nature. And I think about this idea of our ecological footprint, right? And that idea of our, how much impact we as humans have on the planet. Regenerative to me is thinking about our ecological handprint. Like how are we also, you know, supporting ecosystems, like helping ecosystems heal and be repaired? How are we planting new things, you know, helping the coral, helping forests, right? Also forest managery, like I'm thinking about the indigenous peoples who have helped with controlled burns and forest managery to help, you know, ecosystems really flourish and thrive. So I think of regeneration on the ecological scale to be something that is life affirming, life supportive, but also it's on the human. Like I think about a lot of people are concerned with burnout, have experienced burnout or are worried about it, especially in activism, especially in the face of the ecological and social challenges of our time. So what does it mean to be regenerative personally? It means to really care for the soil of our own livelihood gardens, to do self-care in a way that feels restorative and literally regenerative so that we can continue to serve life and be a part of life. So, and then also regenerative livelihoods, that's a frame that, that I use a lot, but I, I love this idea of like livelihood being regenerative in the way that it is supportive of regenerative economics and our own regeneration as, as individuals. So yeah, I think I resonate with the term, but I do see you're right that it is used often. And I think this other question is like, yeah, what is the overall umbrella or frame? Is everything that we're talking about post-growth economics? Is it regenerative economics? Uh, is it eco-socialism? That's another another frame. The new economy, the next system. And again, personally, as a deep generalist, I think I, I code switch depending on who an audience is. If somebody could really hear ecological economics, like they appreciate that lineage, then I might use that. If somebody is more like Buddhist economics frame, I might use that. New economy, solidarity economy or regenerative economics. So I think there's also uh, a usefulness in the language depending on the audience by way of getting us to connect and be able to really listen to one another so that we can actually be here together and work together instead of feeling triggered by certain words that automatically make us defensive or not want to collaborate. I love that. And, and um, I'm, I'm right in alignment with you. And, and that really... Before I get to the, the hardest question, I want to kind of tie it into uh, the, the core fundamentals of uh, the meaning of economics and, and mm -hmm. kind of, you've said this before, and I kind of want you to use your words and where you got it from and kind of learn. It's really about how do we get to know our home and how that ties back to economics. Yeah. So if we go to the etymology, economics, 
oikos nomos from Greek, management of the home. And at first it was management of a domestic home, a familial home, right? The, the finances of a home. And then it was brought in to think about the nation state home, the country home. And folks like Kate Rayworth say, due to the nature of the interconnectedness of our global system and us you know, pushing over the, our planetary boundaries, 21st century economics must be management of our planetary home, right? So one question is, who is responsible for planetary home managing, right? And it is certainly not a group of older white men, <laughs> right? And just them and everyone else just waits for their instructions or follows orders, right? We are all collectively a part of managing our home, including the biotic community or the more than human world, right? Gaia or our planetary systems, our ecosystems, keystone species, for example, the bees, the, the fish, the starfish, the corals, like they're all a part of collectively managing our home. So we all are. So, you know, it's like that Thomas Berry quote, the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects that we are co-participating in the unfolding of our planet and the caretaking of our planet. In addition to managing our home, we also have to think about, well, how do we manage our home if we do not deeply know our home. And so that connects us with the word ecology, right? Oikos logos, knowledge of our home, knowledge of our home. So Satish Kumar, founder of Schumacher College, who you mentioned earlier, he once walked into the London School of Economics and he said, how can you call yourself a school of economics without a department of ecology? How can you seek to manage our home when you do not deeply know our home? So uh, that's why this connection with our bioregions, our watersheds, this is why, you know, permaculture or other practices of deep listening, of being in relation with land, of noticing changes of migratory patterns or of populations of bees or of seasons, right? That's why that's so important because when we deeply know our home and we can send in, into the condition and the health of our home, then we can participate more helpfully and healthily in our collective co-managing. That is so beautifully framed. There is something interesting because there's also the mycorrhizal economy, the wood wide web economy, the, the, uh, uh, the economy of, of not only fungal economy, um, there are so many different things that tie to the natural world that create economies in and of itself. A, a, a agrarian society is an economy all based around farming and agriculture um, and the basic resources uh, of us. That kind of ties to a much deeper thing and another person that I'm sure you've dealt with and, and heard about over the years, not only through Fritz Hof, but others, is Lynn Margulis, who turned the scientific community on its head through symbiogenesis, symbiosis, a symbiotic earth, and basically going against what we've been talking about a, a lot here, that there is really no such thing as neoliberalism or neo-Darwinism and this uh, survival of the fittest, natural selection, only the strong survive, severe competition, that actually the way that the world works in this, this overarching model is in collaboration and cooperation and symbiosis is how the world works, not in, in this uh, misunderstanding of, of natural selection. And that that is actually an ecological phenomenon, symbiosis as one of the, the, the biggest sources of evolutionary human innovation that we've ever seen. It's actually beyond an exponential. It's a super exponential. And goes in uh, what they call, uh, you know, quantum tunneling or, or super abundance. Uh, if we live in symbiosis, if we understand and apply that in our organizations, in our lives, in our economic models, the way we interact with the natural world, our planet, our earth, the Gaian systems, that we actually have abundant life. We have the, the we stay within the planetary boundaries. We operate in those things. And so, I really wanted to see how, how often do you deal with with Lynn Margulis's work with symbiosis, this terminology from Glenn Albrecht that we need new words for a new world and we need to get out of the Anthropocene to go to 
the symbiote scene, what, what are your interactions uh, in, in your daily life and your work that you do and teach with uh, Lynn and, and symbiosis? Yeah. My main connection with Lynn's work has come from Dr. Stephen Harding. So the deep ecologist at Schumacher College and learning about, yeah, Gaia theory and, and the symbiosis of our earth that way. And it is that those insights have really been a part of what I call this upstream journey that I've been in. And this it's this metaphor from public health where you see people who are floating down the river drowning, you jump in to save them, pull them to shore, you look up, there's more people floating down the river, you call for help. And eventually some people have to go upstream to figure out why are why is everyone falling in in the first place? So I heard this metaphor and embarked on a journey upstream with my co-producer of the podcast. But just in general, the, all of this economic stuff has been looking at this journey upstream to what are the root causes. And as I've gone upstream from the challenges of our time, the first step that I've found is supremacy. So power over dynamics, right? Patriarchal supremacy, capitalist supremacy, human supremacy over nature, Christian supremacy supremacy can also be there, white supremacy. And then going upstream from supremacy or power over dynamics, we find separation, right? Separation of ourselves. Because to have power over something, you first need to be separate from. You need to other it. And then going upstream from that, we find the small sense of self, the, the, the small self, so to speak. And so from there at that like root cause of our perception of who we are as humans and our perception of self as rugged, isolated individuals, homo economicus, right? From there, we can remember that we are something different or that we have the capacity to be something different, the symbiocene or symbiosis, or that we are part of Gaia, the ecological self. That is the remembering, remembering ourselves to the web of life from that remembering that ecological self going back downstream on the other side, we come into a reconnection with one another and more the more than human world, a symbiosis, a working together, a collaboration. And then from there, we come into an economics of solidarity, of mutual aid, of connectedness, right? And we find that tragedy of the commons is a myth and actually we can manage commons together. We find that we are not homo economicus. We actually are you know, connected beings like Ubuntu, right? Kind of view of, of humanity. So I would say that that Lynn's work and, and all of the kind of deep ecology work has been really helpful on this journey upstream, upstream to find these insights to then be able to come back down to an economies of interconnectedness and symbiosis. I was um, in... Songdo, Korea, doing the next iteration of goals um, after the sustainable development goals, which we wanted to do the regenerative development goals from December 2030 to December 2050. But uh, the craziness of the United Nations just couldn't let it happen. They couldn't think that far into the future. And uh, we ended up turning over what we, what we call the resilience frontiers or the resilience development goals. But when I was at this National Adaptation Program Expo of the United Nations for Adaptation and Mitigation, doing these five-day workshops on uh, the next goals coming after the Sustainable Development Goals, there was a uh, at the expo, there was a Professor Choi who spoke. And I don't know if you've ever heard of him out, out of Japan or heard of his work. Um, and I, I'm probably, I need to put on my glasses because I think I'm, uh, Professor Choi J. J. Chun, if and sorry if I, uh, uh, but he said actually coined this term and said we need to become Homo symbiosis. And so, as you said, Homo economicus. Uh, um, I, I would I would love to see us kind of make that evolutionary, that symbiotic evolutionary, that uh, e ecological phenomenon that we have to actually get to that homo symbiosis that we we have this this interplay and interaction with with this gaia uh, and, and get, get to get to that so I, when when you mentioned homo economicus I, this kind of what came to my mind uh, of that point in time um all of this that we've discussed has been absolutely fabulous but i want to ask you the hardest question now uh of the podcast and it's one that i have asked um, 
quite a few people and also always on video. It's uh, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Not for anybody else, just for you. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And you you know where this comes from. It comes from our Buckminster Fuller. It's over 70 years old. It comes from his new world game or the world game, peace game that he used to play. Also owned by the Schumacher College is, is actually owns the the trust of of the Buckminster Fuller Institute and, and the riots. And, I would love to know what your thoughts, your ideas on this, how, if you've contemplated that question before. Yeah. A world that works for everyone. I mean, first I'm assuming that the everyone is not just the human world, right? It's all beings. So I'm just making that clear and then works for everyone that really just to draw that out a little bit reminds me again of like, well, what does it mean to work for? Like, what are the metrics of success? So I'm going to assume a sense of thriving, a sense of flourishing. So I think of the great turning, which is a frame I learned from Joanna Macy, a, a way that we can describe this time, a turning towards life. So it's, it's, you know, turning towards love, towards life, towards flourishing, towards thriving. So that's what I'm assuming by a world that works for everyone. And then I would really lean on Buddhist philosophy and practice for this answer. Just that that beautiful understanding that physical pain, change, and death are inevitable. They're all parts of life for human and more than humans. They're going to happen to all of us. And the more that we can you know, accept that old age sickness and death and change are an inevitable part of life. Um, the, <laughs> the, the easier it'll be for us when we do experience that for ourselves or for others. And yet what is changeable or what is not necessarily inevitable is suffering. So that first part is pain, old age, sickness, death, change. That's painful. But suffering comes from that second arrow, as Buddhism would say, that way that we either think about the, the pain or the suffering, or that we exacerbate the suffering on top of the inevitable. And so a world that works for everyone is where there isn't that suffering. There isn't that additional, you know, the, the points of structures that are exclusionary, right? Or structures that create harm or pressure, right? Structures or systems that are more kind or compassionate, that are regenerative, right? That are not extractive or exploitive, right? So I think about it on a world that works for everyone on all levels. It's interpersonal. It's the ways that we call each other in, that we listen, that we're kind, that we're nonviolent in our communication, that we're compassionate, right? But it's also in widening circles of reciprocity. So it's also in our neighborhoods. It's in our you know, political systems, economic systems, all the way to our planetary system. So that on all levels, we're turning towards life and towards what is regenerative and just and equitable and good and loving and kind and compassionate. And we're turning away from unnecessary suffering coming from exploitation and harm. Such a beautiful world that works for everyone. Thank you for sharing that. This is no secret. We we were uh, working together on a world that works fellowship gathering in Bhutan, and and because not only your facilitation, coaching, your 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 knowledge and wisdom around gross national happiness, compassion, Buddhism, and and, and this as well to bring the world's thought leaders, experts, authors, uh, spiritual leaders together in one place and use some of the things we've talked about on this uh, podcast, you know, Otto Sharmer's Theory U process, uh, using um, things from the Gro Center for Gross National Happiness, from all the things that we've discussed here and many more into one kind of longer gathering experience workshop with the reverse classroom model that, that you so greatly uh, understand well and kind of support. Do you see any models or any groups or organizations coming together in our world today? To operating system, uh, 
model or way to bring humanity together to solve or answer that question that you just answered and find the tools to get us on the right side of history, to get us into the future that's out of capitalism, out of some of the destruction, human suffering, global grand challenges that we see, that separation, that all the, all the things that we really don't want to address or even address, kind of talk about what are the new systems that make those obsolete. And if if not, what what do you feel or what do you think about how we could make something like that happen? Is that possible in our world? Is it realistic to even ask this question in the world that we live in? Well, I absolutely think that these gatherings and communities do exist and are happening. And I know that if I said, Mark, tell us your last six months, where you've been, who you've been with, what conferences you've been to, what gatherings, you would tell us so many inspiring people and places and communities who are doing this work. So I absolutely believe they are happening. Um, again, some that I really appreciate, you know, the, the donut economics movement around the world, which does sometimes take physical form in place, but it's also a, a global virtual movement. The Donut Economics Action Lab is a great place for us to gather around the donut and also to make it place based from those interactions and those connections. The beyond growth, post growth movement is also really inspiring around the world. Um, the iterations on a global Green New Deal, I found really interesting as well. Uh, so really saying, let us not have the green transition be capitalist or growth oriented, right? Just changing our one type of energy, oil-based energy to mineral-based energy, right? But actually addressing growth in, and also decolonization and um, even reparations in the process. So that that's a movement that I feel inspired by. Um, as well as many spiritual communities around the world who are doing this great work. So I would say there's so many. In the United States, we have the New Economy Coalition, which is a whole group of folks in that space. The New Economy Organizers Network in the UK is another one. You know, the Via Campesina movement, I would also say, is, is really inspiring. So there's so many around the world that I'm inspired by, and I do see the connections. And, you know, what would be needed to uplift or shift this? Again, it's there's this interesting magic to what touches each of us, what we could say what radicalizes each of us or what inspires each of us. But like what really creates that that shift where we're like, hey, maybe making more and more money and materialism and consumption isn't actually what's bringing me health and happiness. Or, hey, maybe our economy being only based on growth of GDP is not actually helpful for human health and the planet. Whatever that is, that moment that sparks that interest or that curiosity or that break in reality to cause us to do some research, which, you know, light research would get us to all the things that we've mentioned, these books, these, these ideas. Um, so I, I think that break is already happening. And, and those moments are very unique for each of us, right? Different things like different movies or books or conversations touch us differently. But the most most uh, helpful thing I've heard in this frame, again, J Dr. Jennifer Hinton, she showed this graph of change happening in different areas where she showed that there was like um, going along, going along, and then all of a sudden like an exponential change in behavior or action or adoption, right? Like think about... Um, you know, compost, right? Like not places not really having composting to all of a sudden San Francisco, we have to compost or we get fined, right? Or gay marriage, for example, abolishing slavery in the United States, um, fair trade, right? Um, even the world of land acknowledgements and people introducing themselves with their pronouns. Like these things are like, whoa. So what that tells me is that time, and this also comes from Jenny O'Dell, her book, Saving Time. She says, when we think about declinism or determinism, this kind of march forward of time is like, you know, uh, global temperatures rising or um, parts per million of carbon rising, that it's like inevitable. It's like just, it's going to happen, but actually we don't know what's going to happen. And there's these, these tipping points in these moments that happen that really shift things dramatically right? The day before slavery ended and the day after is like a different world. So that was really heartening to me. 
Um, and as well, this idea from Joanna Macy of any act with good intention sends out ripple effects into the web of life in ways we cannot measure or even see. You know, this is not linear work. This is systemic thinking, right? Emergence, right? This magic quality. So, Mark, we have no idea what the results of this conversation between you and I will be. You know, maybe there'll be one person who never heard of Don Economics and looks it up or gross national happiness and then says, I want to go to Bhutan. We have no idea the ripple effects, right? But let's keep doing the work that we're doing, right? Keep participating in the great turning in our individual lives, in our neighborhoods, our communities, and systemically. So at all scales of our life, let's keep trying to align our values and our, our ethics with our actions in the world, right? Through our personal behaviors, but also through our work, through all the ways that we can. Let's open to the very real harm and suffering happening in the web of life, not turn away from it, but turn towards it. Let it ripen us, let it let us feel it, and then let us empoweredly act on it on behalf of the living earth and then as we do that we we have no idea what the outcome will be so to hold that that desire for control or for change lightly and be open to what's possible so i think i, I think that's how i might a answer that question around like how do we create the change that we want to see i think it's already happening and we're doing it in in the question world that works for everyone uh the it's kind of a key takeaway is works for everyone. It, is it utopian? Is it a pie in the sky? Is it too too crazy to 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 think or to say that there is one model that would work for everyone uh, on on the planet and not creating any ecological offense or disadvantage to anyone? Um, to have one unified model that 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 kind of does it for all of us. Do you think that's a little too out there or do you think that would even be possible? You know, I again think of like the our global ecological footprint is thinking about us as humans having a negative and then I think about our handprint as us in symbiosis and collaboration and cooperation. Um, and so I do believe there can be moments of collaboration coordination where there is thriving and things do work for everyone, so to speak. And I'm also thinking about like win wins, like when have you in your life been a part of a, like a dinner party or a gathering or an activity where it just felt like it was a win for everyone. Like there was flow, there was cohesion, there was goodness. Right. So I, I think that there can be, and I think it really is about a broadening of the movement. Like I said, maybe it's regenerative economics. Maybe that frame is broad broad enough. Maybe it's post growth economics. Maybe that's broad enough. I mean, to me, these are very similar. They're just kind of emphasizing different aspects of it. But I think they're all in the right direction in the direction of the great turning, so to speak. Um, so I think we we do have holistically the movement. And it's just about uplifting them, broadening them, and also getting into the corridors of power where decisions are made. Some of these things are best at a certain scale. And so I think I think that's another element of it, too. But wherever you are in the system, there's probably there is absolutely a way that you can contribute to this movement of regenerative ecological new economy, post growth economics. We're, we've thrown all around a lot of terminology and, and discussions. I really want you to tell us about uh, a couple more things as we wrap up. You're teaching this uh, course or you offer a course through Gaia Education. Uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about that, what it looks like. And, and I mean, you teach a lot of different courses, plus your podcast upstream. But can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So I, uh, in learning all of what I learned through Schumacher and through the podcast, really wanted a way to help make sense of it in people's lives. So that's why I became a Right Livelihood Coach. And that's like by donation, one-on-one -on -one work. And I've, I've worked with about over 200 different clients now at this point. And I don't know the exact number, but it's definitely over 200. And so as I've been doing that, I've noticed what the similar challenges are to cultivating right livelihood and also what the helpful like reframes or tools are for cultivating right livelihood. So Guy Education said, would you develop a course for us on cultivating a regenerative livelihood? That's the title of it. And so I work with Sylvia de Blasio on that. And we just lead a course once a year. It's in January of each year for about eight weeks. And it's 
a, a guided journey of helping each of us cultivate regenerative livelihood wherever you are. Some people are unemployed. Some people are hoping to transition. Some people are creating something new. So there's so many different entry points to cultivating regenerative livelihood. Wherever you are is, is where you are on the path, right? It's a process, not a destination. So I, I get to do that work and that's been really joyful. And then the other thing for guy education is co-teaching the economic dimension. And I'm actually going to be rewriting the economic dimension. Daniel Christian Wall has been one of the people who's who's done that before. Um, Jonathan Dawson of Schumacher College. Um, so I'm I'm excited to do that. Also Naresh, uh, another founder of Co uh, Transition Town. So I'm I'm looking forward to that. But that's going to be a huge endeavor. But grateful for that opportunity of trying to tell the ecological economics you know landscape of our time. We, you also have a lot of ties to permaculture and how, um, and, and probably even regenerative ag and natural farming, biodynamic or organics, the old Rudolf Steiner kind of things as well. Um, what, what can you tell us about that? And how, how have you noticed over the years that that really ties into economics or yes. some, as a great example and, and things and how there's actually permaculture ec economics as well. Absolutely. So I have to share some gratitude for David Shaw, who's been my mentor and comrade on this. He was in a Work That Reconnects retreat with me with Joanna Macy several years ago, and he was creating a permaculture institute. And he had been to Schumacher College studying with Vandana Shiva. And so then I went to Schumacher College, came back and reconnected with him. And he asked if I could teach a day long on all of his PDCs, his permaculture design certificates of financial permaculture. And so there is some material out there on financial permaculture, either social permaculture, financial permaculture is pretty much a part of every permaculture design certificate, but it's not usually given a full day. So it was really a beautiful invitation to be able to think, how might I teach all of this uh, alternative economics, ecological regenerative economics in one day? Um, and part of it is connected with the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share, right? Earth care is very much front and center in a permaculture course, typically. But what about that people care and the fair share? Where does that come in? Um, as well as when you think about a permaculture site, you think about zones, right? Like the house and the area around it and the, the larger plot of land, and they're, they're called different zones. But what about zone 0.0, .0 which is the zone in our, our head, right? Our paradigms, our worldviews. And also what about the zones beyond the plot of land that our permaculture site is on? right? It doesn't exist in isolation. We're in widening systems, right? Supply chains and impacts, right? Climate change, social systems, etc. So I love financial permaculture, getting to work with students of permaculture to both think about the paradigm shift that is necessary for really creating a culture of earth care, people care, and fair share, but also to think like, how does their site or their land or their project, how does that interact with the other systems? And how can we support the health of that system, but the health of the other systems so that we have like widening benefits of this permaculture work that we're doing. Beautiful. I, I absolutely love it. I, I tie um, not only agriculture, organics, regenerative ag, permaculture, uh, all back into economics and to one of our oldest economic systems our world's ever seen, the longest running, the most successful, also the most damaging on our planet. The agrarian society is probably one of the most damaging uh, economic systems for our planet and human health. Um, but I, I love the way you, you tie that in, you bring it in, in into perspective. I also say, you know, we need some good bullshit to make great compost, some good stinky poop to make good compost. And when you have good topsoil, good compost in a pile and you grab a handful of that, it actually doesn't stink anymore. It actually smells pretty good. Uh, and there's a lot of things in that whole process of, of good gardening, of good permaculture, of good regenerative ag where we see the things that we've touched on this uh, podcast throughout the discussion. We've mentioned exponential, super exponential abundance and many other things. 
is that why, why do compost piles heat up? Why do they get so hot? A lot of people say, oh, it's the off gassing. It's, it's this, it's that. Well, it's, it's actually the cells dividing, those cells dividing and dividing the microorganisms feeding that raise that temperature. And there are organic and natural materials in there, but there's also waste. There's also that, and I tease, we need a little bit of the bullshit of the bad systems, the bad players in our world to feed that natural, healthy compost and that balance of life to, to bring about good things. And, and so I love how you tie that into the real world living systems and into um, our, our daily lives because we deal with food and, and growing food is the, the best way to, it's like printing your own money. So what a better economic system than kind of getting into that. Uh, as we close up, I just want to um, see if you can maybe tickle and help us with a couple more understandings. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about a, a possible book collaboration work that you're kind of working on, or is that still top secret? I had the real joy of getting to work with the London School of Economics as a senior fellow at the um, the Atlantic Fellowship for Economic Inequality. And there they really um, helped us understand the root causes of inequality and encouraged us to do a place-based project. So the book that I'm finishing right now is all about what are the root causes of economic inequality in the San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area which is where I'm from, where I'm currently living, but also the heart of Silicon Valley. So there's a lot can come from understanding what's happening here for the rest of the world. Um, and then the other side of the book is around the systemic alternatives, the solutions, a lot of what we talked about today, but really framing them as like invitations. And so I'm just trying to work on uh, different scales or levels. So trying to do work in San Francisco, then trying to do work in California, California Donut Economics Coalition, the, the United States, and then globally. And so I really try to find how can I contribute at each scale of the system to shift the system to being something more regenerative and just. Well, I know for a fact that we're going to, our paths are crossed. We'll speak often when that book's done. I'd love to be one of the first to, to read it and interview you, have you, have you on the podcast and do a deep dive discussion as we've had now. And, and I really uh, would love to collaborate with you on, on anything in the future so that we can bring more of these, um, raising up the messages and kind of bringing the message out there because uh, it's, it's ec economics is not boring. Like most of us thought it's actually pretty exciting. And it's something that can, can make a good life, a uh, well-being or the, uh, uh, a wonderful, beautiful, abundant life if we do it in the right way. And so um, I would love to, to, to collaborate with you on that. That's really all I have for you, but I want to ask you just at the end, is there anything that we didn't get to talk about that you wanted to kind of bring out in a message that you would like to leave the listeners as we close up? Well, something you just said reminded me of a quote. So I'd love to close with a quote. This is Giannis Varoufakis, who folks likely know, former finance minister of Greece, currently working on uh, Europe Green New Deal. But he said, um, we must all understand that empowering citizens to speak authoritatively about the economy is a prerequisite for democracy and a precondition for the good society. There are no economic experts. There are experts when it comes to things like building a bridge. If you want to build a bridge, you can't do it democratically because the bridge could collapse and it would be a major crime. But the economy is the way in which we organize social power, who has power over their lives and who doesn't. That is a question of democracy. So if we are to accept that there's a group of experts and we have to defer to them when it comes to economic matters, then effectively we accept oligarchy. So to close, I would say my closing invitation is just for folks to start to feel in and notice the economic system that they're a part of, notice how it is delivering ill health and harm and exploitation uh, to themselves, our bodies, our perception of purpose, our 
um, confidence, right, our resilience, but also our communities as well as the planet. Um, and then to search into what might have in, have piqued your interest here, what might have inspired you. There are groups on the hyperlocal level, on the city level, the bioregional level, the state level, the country level, and the global level. So wherever you are, how might you contribute to this sh the systems change, this changing of our economic system to be more regenerative and equitable and just and, and really be a part of this great turning. Della Duncan, thank you so much for lending us all insight of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. Get to know our home. It's our job as understanding ecology and economics is to get to know our home. And when we understand it, boy, the, the beauty and wonderful things we can do. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.